Welcome to Giving an Answer, the show dedicated to defending the historic Christian faith. I am your host, H.C. E. Felder. Today I will be doing a teaching on the topic, Are Christianity and Science Compatible? Is a choice necessary? Now I have a confession here. The, my favorite show of all times is Lost. I watched every single episode. Six seasons, I never missed a show. I love this show. I tried to get my wife to watch it, but every time I tried to get her to watch Lost, she would say, I'm just lost. So she never really got into it. But what's really interesting about Lost, these are two of the primary characters here. We have Jack Shepard, who is a doctor. No, not only is he a doctor, he is a surgeon. And you have John Locke. Now, what's interesting about these two characters is that Jack Shepard, the surgeon, was a man of science. John Locke was a man of faith. And they would collide throughout the whole season because John would always be trying to get Jack to do things on the basis of faith. And Jack would say, no, I'm a man of science. I don't do things based on faith. That's what you do. I'm a man of science. And the, the implication is, is that you can't be both. You have to either be a man of science or a man of faith because the two just don't seem to go together. So you have to choose between whether you're going to be a person of faith or a person of science. But it's, is this choice really true? Is this choice really necessary? Well, let's see. This is the roadmap. This is what I'm going to be discussing today. I'm going to talk about what science is. I want to try and give a definition. Now, I'm going to give a shot at it, but no matter what definition you give, someone's going to have an issue with it. Why does science and Christianity seem to be contradictory? Why do people say that you cannot be both a, a person of science and a person of faith? Why do you have to either be a Christian or a scientist? I'm going to talk about scientism. You've never, you've, maybe you have never heard that word before, but if you haven't, that's fine. I'm going to tell you exactly what it is. I'm going to explain the fact that science has limits. Although it may purport to be the source of all knowledge, it cannot be the source of all knowledge. I'm going to actually talk about the fact that many scientists really are Christians. And I'm going to end with this very important point that not only is science and Christianity compatible, but science isn't even possible without God. God is necessary for science to even happen. Okay? Because, like I said, every definition that I was going to come up with, someone will have an issue with it. I went to Webster. This is Webster's definition of what science is. A systematic knowledge of the physical and material world gained through observation and experimentation. So it's basically the study of the physical world, the things around you, the things that you can, you can touch and you can feel and you can see, you can smell. This is the domain of science. Now, why does science and Christianity seem to be contradictory. Why does there seem to be this antithesis between the two of them? Why, why does it seem to be that they just can't get along? Well, let's look at what science is. Science is actually the study of God's natural revelation. The world, the universe, was all created by God. It is God's way of telling us about him through his creation. And it's really interesting because you can learn a lot about God just by looking at his creation. For instance, I can look at just what God has done, and I can make certain observations. I can say, well, if God created the universe, then, well, he must have been all-powerful because who in the world can create a universe out of nothing? He must be eternal because there is no time without the universe because time is a property of the universe. So he must be eternal. He must be all powerful. He must have a will because he had to make a decision to actually make the universe. It wasn't because if he never made the decision, there would be no universe. So there's some things I can tell about God just from nature. 
And scripture tells us that there are some things we can tell about God from nature. Psalms 18.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. I mean, how often do you just look around at nature and you just look around at your surroundings and you just feel this sense of awe? When I was an atheist, I told, I, I, I told this a number of times before, but it wasn't difficult being an atheist most of the time, but the times when it was really difficult was when I was in the Navy and I was out at sea, and I would look up at the stars at night, and I would know that Pookie didn't make that. No man that I ever seen made that. It was beyond comprehension that anyone could have possibly made that, but someone who was beyond our understanding. What else does scripture say? Romans 1, 19 through 20. What may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, been understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. God wants people to know that he is there, that he is all-powerful. God wants people to have this sense of awe when they look at the nature around them. So that's what natural revelation is. Natural revelation lets us know that there is a God and that there are certain things about that God that we can come to know. Now, Scripture, on the other hand, is what we call special revelation. Now, Scripture tells us things about God that we can't know from natural revelation. For instance, although I say from natural revelation, we can understand that God is eternal, that God is all-powerful, but we can't know about salvation by looking at God's creation. We can't know about sin. We can't know about God's plan of salvation through Jesus Christ. We can't know about those things by looking at the creation. So that's why we have special revelation in the Bible to tell us more things about God that has made himself evident in nature. Since natural revelation and special revelation have the same author, God, there cannot be a contradiction between the two. The Bible can never contradict nature. Nature can never contradict the Bible because they have the same author, God. Well, then why does there seem to be this antithesis? Why does there seem to be a struggle between the two? If they can never contradict one another, why do theologians and scientists argue? Why is there this camp who believe that you are either a person of faith or you're a person of science because you can't be both? Why does it seem that they can't get along if they both have the same author? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. The appearance of contradictions are based on this. Either science is misinterpreting nature. For example, science previously said that the universe was eternal. Now we know that the universe is not eternal. Scientists looked at nature and misinterpreted nature. Or theologians can misinterpret scripture. Here's an example. Galileo. Galileo observed that the sun is the center of our solar system. Now, before that, the church believed that the earth was the center of our solar system. So when Galileo came up with his discovery, the church rebuffed him. But see, here's the thing. Scripture never says that the earth is the center of, the, of our galaxy or of our solar system. It never says that. This, this was an example of man misinterpreting Scripture. Just like Scientists can misinterpret nature. Theologians and Christians and believers can misinterpret scripture. That is where all of the differences come from. That is where all the contradictions come from because nature itself and scripture itself can never contradict one another. True science actually points people toward God. This is C.S. Lewis, Christian writer favorite Christian writer. He's an apologist. He's a defender of the faith. A lot of you may know him by the Tales of Narnia. He's, this is the same guy that wrote the Tales of Narnia. But he's written a lot of stuff about God other than that. This is what he says. 
He wrote a book called The Screw Tape Letters. Have anyone of you ever heard of The Screw Tape Letter? Okay. Now, this is a good book. It's really an interesting book because it's not a novel or anything like that. It is just a series of letters. It's letters between a senior demon. Of course, this is not real. This is fictitious. It's, a letter, it's letters between a senior demon and a junior demon. The junior demon is trying to recruit someone. And the senior demon is giving them all kinds of advice on how to do that. So this is just correspondence between a senior demon and a junior demon. And this is what the senior demon is saying. Do not attempt to use science, I mean the real sciences, as a defense against Christianity. They will positively encourage him to talk about realities he can't touch and see. There have been sad cases among modern physicists. Now, if it's a sad case for him, it's a good case for us. If he must dabble in science, keep him on economics and sociology. But the best of all is to let him read no science, but to give him a grand general idea that he knows it all and that everything he happens to have picked up in casual talk and reading is a result of modern investigation. Incredible advice from a senior demon to a junior demon. Because isn't that what we see? I mean, those who, who are not believers are, are supposed to be on such high intellectual grounds. They're supposed to be the elite. They're supposed to be the ones, who, they're the ones who thumb their nose up at all this Christianity and all this miracle and all this God stuff. If you talk to someone who believes in evolution, they've never seen it before. They've never personally witnessed it. But of course, you know, every, any educated man would believe in that. They believe it because they've been taught that, because they've just picked it up from casual conversation. They picked it up from school. They picked it up from TV. They picked it up from society, although none of them have actually observed it. This is the society we live in. Now, I just mentioned the fact that science and Christianity, or science and God, are not incompatible. They are completely compatible. What is incompatible with God is scientism. Scientism and science are two different things. Remember the ism, you know, the ism, atheism, you know, uh, theism, all these different belief systems with the isms on it. I'm, I'm throwing another one at you, scientism. What is scientism? C.S. Lewis defines scientism as a thesis that the methods of the natural sciences should be used in all areas of investigation, including philosophy, the humanities, and the social sciences, a belief that only such methods can fruitfully be used in the pursuit of knowledge. In other words, science is the end-all and be-all of all knowledge. Science is the only thing that can tell you the proper way to do things. It's the only thing that can lead you in the truth, and it can lead you in the truth about everything. Doesn't matter what it is. Doesn't matter if it's about uh, molecules or if it's about how to love your wife or it's about how to treat your kids or raise your kids. Science is the ultimate answer to all our problems. That's scientism. A related term is reductionism, which is the belief that human behavior is simply a matter of neurons firing in the brain, and as a result, humans, human responsibility doesn't exist. I've actually heard this defense used in court cases where people have said that they are not responsible for the triple homicide they did because it was the way they were wired. It's their genes. There's no free will because free will doesn't exist because you're just a robot just going by the way you're programmed in your genes. Isn't that interesting? You know, we already live in a society where it's not my fault. It's not my problem. It's always someone else's. This gives you a perfect excuse because this is the way you were born. You couldn't help it. I mean, you were just doing what you were supposed to do when you killed all those people. Why should they blame you? You didn't have a choice. Another term is materialism, which means that everything that exists is material. If you can't touch it, if you can't smell it, it does not exist. Everything that exists is material. Now, can you think of some things that this might not apply to? Can you think of some things where this might be an issue? Because I sure can. The thing that comes to mind immediately is when I, I think of scripture, when I think of 
how God created man out of the dust of the earth and how he blew the breath of life into his nostril and man became a living soul. I just love that picture. I just love that picture. But here's the thing. If we are just a combination of parts, then when the soul leaves the body, the body's still there. Why doesn't it continue to live? If we are just a collection of body parts, why can't I take an arm from you and a leg from you and put them together and have something that lives? Why can't I do that? How come if someone dies, for instance, drowning, and all the pieces are still there, yet they're dead? If we all just matter, there's no reason why that, should, that person should not be able to get back up. The reason that person cannot get back up is that we are a combination of spirit and body. And once the spirit leaves the body, you're dead. You cannot touch the spirit. You cannot smell the spirit. You cannot weigh the spirit. But the spirit exists. There are plenty of things around us that exist that we cannot touch. Love. Love is an emotion that you can't touch. You can't say, give me a pound of love or, or show me what color love is. I was talking to an atheist one time and I asked him what was love. And he said it's just these neurons going off in your brain that, that allows you to feel a certain way. I said, is that what you tell your wife? I just have these chemical reactions in my brain right now. Will you marry me? We all know that's ridiculous. It doesn't even make any sense. The color red, it is something that exists outside of an object that it's attached to. I can say red to you and you know what red is. But you can't put a pound of red on a scale. It exists even though you can't touch it or feel it. There are plenty of things that we can't touch and feel and we know that they exist. The atheist who writes his book denouncing God has ideas in his head about what he's going to write. He has these words in his head. Those words can't be measured. They can't be, they can't be weighed, yet they exist because they would never come down on paper if they did not. Oh, there are plenty of things that exist outside of what we can touch and what we can feel. And it really interests me when atheists say that because when I say to them, what is love? And he says to me, it's neurons. I'm, I'm not asking you what causes it. I'm asking you what is the thing in and of itself? Not what happens in your brain when you're feeling that, but what is the thing in and of itself? Scientism excludes God. Leading atheist Richard Dawkins says this. It is absolutely safe to say that if you meet someone who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is stupid, ignorant, or insane. This is a leading atheist here. This is one of the big boys. And he truly believes that. Because evolution is godless. Evolution is materialistic. There is no need or no place for God. And evolution. That is why a lot of atheists adhere to it because it is something that they would like to believe. Another day I'm gonna do another talk on the evidence for evolution. You will be surprised at the little amount of evidence that there is for it. But when you look at the acceptance of it, you will start to understand the acceptance of it if you understand why people believe in it. And it's not based on the scientific evidence per se. Like I was an atheist. I was an atheist because I didn't want to be held accountable to a God. I didn't want someone telling me what I should do or shouldn't do. I didn't want to answer to anyone but me, myself, and I. And you have a lot of people who are like that just now. doesn't matter what evidence you would have showed them. They're going to believe what they want to believe because it's comfortable for them in their lifestyle. I once asked an atheist who didn't believe in the resurrection. I was debating him. And I asked him, I said, well, what would it take for you to believe in the resurrection? And he never responded. Because, see, even if Jesus appeared to him, he would tell himself that that was just my imagination. It was just a dream. There was nothing that was going to get him to believe. There are some people who would not believe regardless of what the evidence is. 
Science has its limit. It is not the end all and be all of all knowledge. It is an inadequate view of the world. Erwin Schrodinger, founder of wave mechanics and the originator of the most important equation in science wrote, I am very astonished that the scientific picture of the real world is so deficient. It gives a lot of factual information, puts all the experience in a magnificently consistent order, but it is ghastly silent about all the sundry that is really near to our heart, that really matters to us. It cannot tell us a word about red or blue or bitter or sweet, physical pain or physical delight. It knows nothing of beauty and ugly, good or bad, God or eternity. Everyone has a hole in their heart, just the right size for God to fit into it. Nothing else is going to be able to do that. A reporter was interviewing this guy right here. Now, I, I, I'm going to tell you right now, before I start, I'm going to butcher his name, because I have no idea how to say this guy's name. All right. Shub, okay. Uh... Shumayan? <laughs> okay. I call him C. That's his last name. I call him C. Let's just work with that. <laughs> All right. This guy was interviewing him. This guy who was interviewing him was really fascinated by him because this guy has had so many accomplishments in the, in the scientific world. So he wanted, to, he wanted to know what this guy thought because this guy was near the end of his life and he wanted to know what he thought as he reflected back over his life. You know, such a monument to science and such, such, such great contributions he's made. He wanted to know, you know, how that must have made him feel so complete, knowing that he contributed so much to science. And this was, this was his response. In fact, I consider myself an atheist. But I have a feeling of disappointment because the hope for contentment and a peaceful outlook on life as a result of pursuing a goal has remained largely unfulfilled. What is true for my own personal case is that I simply don't have the sense of harmony which I had hopeful when I was young. Isn't it amazing how many people pursue this goal all their lives and they achieve this goal only to realize they're just as empty as they were before they achieved it. There was this show that used to come on the biography channel called Dark Stars and they would chronicle a famous pop singer. And one particular show I was watching was with Jimi Hendrix. And it was showing how his whole life he was just obsessed with becoming the greatest guitarist. That's all he thought about. That's all he lived for. And it showed him after he reached that pinnacle, after he was the world's greatest guitarist, and how that brought him no joy. Nothing. Once you reach the, the pinnacle of what you thought, was the ultimate and you still don't have that joy, what do you do? You try and find it other places. So he went to alcohol and the drugs and all the things that, that he thought maybe could allow him to have it and OD'd and died because he was pursuing something that he couldn't find where he was looking. They did a show on Janis Joplin and Janis Joplin made this comment that really struck me. She made this comment, she said that every night oh, I go out on stage and when I sing I make love to thousands of people, and I go home alone. She had reached the pinnacle of her career as well, yet there was no fulfillment in it. Just knowing about nature, just understanding the laws of gravity, understanding how God put this together and that together does not give anyone fulfillment. Fulfillment is only found in the God who created the laws, who created the planets, who created the things. When you worship the creation, you're always going to be held short. You're always going to fall short because the creation cannot fulfill you. Only the creator can. Only the creator can. I had a guest here on my show one time, Derwin Gray, played for the Panthers, cornerback. He gave his testimony here, very powerful testimony. He talked about how he was NFL rolling, you know, the women, the money, all of it. He was in a championship game playing against the Dallas Cowboys and got hurt. And that was his last game. And he talked about how 
with all the stuff that he wanted. You know how when you go through, because he went to college to bring him young, and you know, all you're thinking about is, you know, if I just get in the pros, you know, if I could just make the pro team, if I can just, you know, just go out there and just get these contracts and just get all these things. And how he mentioned, how he talked about how he, once he got those things, he felt just as empty as he was before he got it. As a matter of fact, even more so. Because when you are looking for those things, you think that you will find happiness once you get there. It is even worse to get there and then realize you've been sold a bill of goods. To realize you've been sold something that doesn't exist. You were told that you were going to be happy. You were told that you were going to be, that you were going to just be in, 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 in bliss. And it's all a lie. Because you are still missing the only thing that can give you meaning. When you, serve, when you worship the creation, you're going to be left empty. Science can tell us nothing about the cause of nature itself. Stephen Hawking, who is probably the most famous living scientist, states the actual point of creation lies outside the scope of the presently known laws of physics. So what caused the universe to come into existence then? There must have been something outside the material world, because before the material world came into being, something must have existed because something must have caused it to come into being. It didn't just happen. How does everything come out of nothing? So scientists can only observe the physical world. They, they are limited only by what they can see and touch. And that is such a, that is, that is, that is just not, even close to all that there is. They're missing out on a lot of reality because the supernatural is just as much a reality as the natural. And they're missing out on it. And they're judging everything by only what they can see and only what they can touch. And they're missing out on the most important part and the most important aspects on life. And that are those things that you cannot see. Science can't tell you, can't answer any of the questions as to why we're here. It can't tell us what the purpose of man is. It can't tell us what happens to us when we die. It can't tell us all the things that we as humans want to know about who we are and where we're coming from and where we're going. It can't tell us any of that. But scripture can. God can. God can tell us exactly the answer to all those questions. The study of the natural world itself always leave you money wanting more. Many scientists actually are Christians. I got to admit, I was a little surprised by this one. I got to admit. I worked at NASA for eight years, and I guess the reason why I guess I'm surprised because the ones that I worked with were atheists. So I guess I assumed that, you know, a lot of them were atheists. But there was a Bible study there, so I mean, there were, there were scientists who were Christians it's just, I guess God wanted me to be around the atheists for some reason. I don't know. Because we used to get into it all the time, and maybe that's what it was about. Maybe God wanted me to, to stretch myself or to stretch them. I'm not exactly sure. But MIT professor Alan Lightman said, contrary to popular myth, scientists appear to have the same range of attitudes about religious matters as does the general public. Physics Nobel Prize winner Richard Feynman wrote, many scientists do believe in both God and science, the God of revelation in a perfectly consistent way. A survey reports that 52% of biologists identify themselves as Christians, not just believers in God, but specifically Christians. A survey showed that on any given Sunday, 41% of all PhD scientists are in church. And for the general population, that's 42%. So that's actually interesting, because you would believe if science has disproven God or if science was all that fulfilling, then why are so many scientists still Christians? Evidently, they don't see a contradiction between Christianity and God. As I mentioned, there is no contradiction. The contradiction is between scientism and God, not science and God. Robert Griffins, professor of physics at Carnegie Mellon University, was quoted as saying, if we need an atheist for a debate, 
I have to go to the philosophy department. The physics department isn't of much use. And when asked why does he believe so many are believers, and this is a talk for another, another day. I'm just going to touch on it briefly. It's because most of them see what I refer to as the anthropic principle. And what that, what that simply means is that when they look at the universe, they see that the universe has these fine-tuned constants that allow for Earth to house us as beings. For instance, if we were a little bit closer to the sun, we would burn up. If we were further away, we would freeze. The rotation of the Earth, the speed of the rotation of the Earth is, is important to life on this Earth. If we were smaller, we couldn't we couldn't live. If it was faster, we couldn't live. The amount of oxygen in the air, when we breathe out the, the, the mixture of oxygen, the, the carbon dioxide, all of this is part of the, the constants. Jupiter, if Jupiter were further away, we wouldn't exist because Jupiter, as a big planet, with this big gravitational pull, sucks in all these meteorites that would have destroyed the Earth a long time ago. And it, it's basically like our protector. And there are all these different constants, there are all these different reasons why it seems like life is just fine-tuned for, for, for man, right here on this planet. That's why a lot of scientists actually are Christians, because they look at the universe, and they look, and they see design, and they know that no man could have done it. They know that the odds of all this happening for one planet is astronomical. It's actually been calculated, and I can't remember what it is. Actually, it's the same number that corresponds to the a number of atoms in the universe. I think it's like 1 and 10 to the 120 power, something crazy. But it's the same amount of atoms that there are in the universe. That gives you an idea how unlikely it is that, that all those constants would, would come together in one place on Earth. Now, God actually makes science possible. Without God, there is no science. OK? What I mean? The faith of scientists arose historically from the Christian belief that God the Father created a perfectly orderly universe. The reason why we can do science is because there is a universe that is orderly. There is a universe that was created by laws. There is a universe that makes sense. You know that when you drop an apple, it's going to fall and it's not going to go up in the air. You know that, 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 that the orbits are fine-tuned. You know that everything around us is design, and that design comes from a mind. And that design and these natural laws allows man to say, okay, let me study how these natural laws work. Man can look at what God did and understand how God did. There's no problem with that. No problem with understanding how God did what he did. But if you were in another place where, where you didn't believe in in these type of, um, where, where if there were no laws, then science wouldn't be possible because you couldn't count on anything. You couldn't make any laws. You couldn't understand any laws because things that just happen willy-nilly. Things don't happen willy-nilly here because they are designed by a designer. The world-famous scientist Stephen Hawking, when asked by a reporter whether science and Christianity were competing worldviews, he responded, then Newton would not have discovered the law of gravity. Because Newton understood that there are laws that God created that allow things to happen. The best way I heard it, one scientist saying that studying science is thinking God's thoughts after him. Just understanding how God is doing what God is doing. Not trying to say that, okay, now we understand how God, this is what I always had a hard time understanding. You have scientists who say, okay, now I understand the laws, then we don't need God anymore. What? That makes no sense. Just because you understand the laws by which he created things doesn't mean that he doesn't need to exist. That's like me saying, that's like me going to school, learning how to fix a car, and saying, okay, now I know how to fix a car. We don't need the car anymore because, I mean, I, I, I know how to fix it. Just because I know how to fix the car doesn't mean I created the car. I didn't design the car. I just know how to fix the car. The person who designed it was a lot smarter than me. That only makes sense. Science has its greatest success under a Christian world view. British scientist Robert Clark wrote, 
Scientific development has only occurred in a Christian culture. In all civilizations, Babylonia, Egypt, Greece, India, Rome, Persia, China, and so on, science developed to a certain point and then stopped. It is easy to argue speculatively that perhaps science might have been able to develop in the absence of Christianity, but in fact, it never did. When you look at the scientists, the great discoveries, it's incredible how many of them are actually believers. As I mentioned, Sir Isaac Newton wrote more theology books than he did science books. Reasons why science have had so much development under Christianity, why is that? If, Christ if Christianity is true, the universe is real and not an illusion. This makes science possible. Because not all worldviews believe this. Remember, pantheism, or you know, Hindus or Buddhists don't believe the world is even real. The universe is not even real. So what's the point of studying something that's, not, that's an illusion in the first place? So under the Christian worldview, at least we believe that the world is real, that the universe is real, that our senses tell us something about the real world. If Christianity is true, the universe, having been created by God, has value and is worth studying. It's really interesting when you look at a map of the galaxy. Most of the galaxy is filled with dust. Only a couple of places in the galaxy where you can be situated, where Earth is situated, where you can see out and to the rest of creation. It's like God put us in a place just so we can look out and see his creation. He put us in a place so that we can look and see the heavens, so we can look and see the stars, so we can look and see the other universes and the other galaxies. He wanted us to know and to see his creation, to see the all that he created in the universe. He expects us to do it. He created it for us. If Christianity is true, then men may freely examine the world free from fear, superstition. You don't want to worry about a spirit being in every rock. You can study the rock. The spirit ain't going to jump out and get you. God wants us to use our intellect to investigate the world that he created because he knows that the more we find out about the world, the more we find out about him and the more it will draw us to him. If Christianity is true, then man is made in the image of God with the ability to use his God-given intellect to learn about the world. Like I said, God wants us to use our mind. He has no problem with us using our mind. Just go through some, some of the Christian scientists. Francis Bacon is actually credited with discovering the scientific method, which is really interesting. This guy was a Christian. Listen to what he says here. Let no one think or maintain that a person can search too far or be too well studied in either the book of God's word or the book of God's works. I like that. He is saying here that they are completely compatible. God's word, God's word. There's no contradiction. There can't be a contradiction with the same author. Blaise Pascal was a magnificent scientist and father of mathematical theory, of probability, all this other stuff. Said Jesus Christ is the end of all and the center to which all tends. Sir Isaac Newton as I mentioned before, is the founder of classical physics who wrote more about theology than science. Once wrote, the most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. Wh William Thomas, later known as Lord Kelvin, recognized as the leading physical scientist and the greatest science teacher of all time, said in a speech, do not be afraid of being free thinkers. If you think strongly enough, you will be forced by science to believe in God. I'm going up through time. Just wanted y'all to show y'all that it's not just the old folks that believe, but some of the newer folks too. Arthur Scarlo, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics for his work in laser spectroscopy, said, we are fortunate to have the Bible and especially the New Testament, which tells us so much about God in widely accessible human terms. John Polkenhorne, chairman, professor, chair professor of mathematical physics at Cambridge University. This guy actually changed careers. He actually changed careers and actually became, got, got to theology and became the president of Queens College. Said, I take God very seriously indeed. I am a Christian believer and I believe that God exists and has made himself known 
in Jesus Christ. Let me just summarize what we've gone through. What is science? Science is merely the study of the physical material world. Why does science and Christianity seem contradictory? Both are based on God's revelation and cannot be in conflict. Appearance of contradiction is due either to misinterpretation of nature or of scripture. Scientism is incompatible with God. Not science, but scientism. Scientism makes science the source of all knowledge. Scientism denies the existence of God. Science has its limits. It has an inadequate view of the world. It cannot give purpose or meaning to life. It cannot explain the origin of the world. Many scientists are, in fact, Christians. Their beliefs reflect society as a whole. Science is not even possible without God. Science is based on a real, orderly world which reflects a designer. The end. Okay? So, do we have questions? Okay. First question. Uh, my question is regarding evolutionist theory. Mm -hmm. How do we debate the evolutionist theory of man existing on earth for millions of years when we are taught and believe as Christians that there are about 42 to 62 generations between Adam and Abraham, Abraham and Jesus, and Jesus to this present day? Okay, that is a good question. Now, here's the thing. Not all Christians believe that those, those particular generations because what generation means, when you look at the Bible and it talks about so-and-so begot so-and-so begot so-and-so, that just means that so-and-so was the ancestor of so-and-so who was the ancestor of so-and-so. So there could have been people or generations missing in there. For instance, we have different genealogies where you see some genealogies omit people that other gene genealogies have. So we don't know if it was just 5,000 years since humans have been around or just those particular generations. It could have been more. A lot of Christians believe that man has been around for uh, millions of years or that the days in Genesis don't refer to literal days but refer to day ages mm. because the word yom which is the word for day it sometimes is used to represent an age and not necessarily a physical 24 hour day period and one of the issues with the physical 24 hour day period is that God starts out by saying you know the first day there was day and there was evening but it couldn't have been day and evening the way we understand it because the moon and the sun hadn't been created yet so not necessarily, those are not necessarily 24-hour periods, and those are not necessarily all the genealogies that existed throughout mankind. Now, that was your first question, right? Now, you mentioned something about evolution. I guess maybe, I, uh, maybe you need to follow up on that one. Uh, well, basically, I was just mentioning the fact that the evolutionist theory um, that man has existed on Earth for millions of years. Okay, okay. And yeah, I mean... It, Man could have been around for longer than 5,000 years. We don't, we don't really know because the Bible doesn't really tell us. And the Bible never says, this, this, is, this is what I'm saying about as far as interpretation. Because that, that 5,000 years that people come up with as far as how long man has been around was someone going through the Bible and counting all the generations. Now, the Bible never comes out and says that man started so-and-so year. The Bible never says that. We are interpreting that by going through the generations, and we are assuming that it's listing all the generations and not missing any. Now, there are very good Christians who believe that, we call them young earthers, believe that the earth is young, and there are very good Christians who believe that the earth is old. All, both of those are compatible with Scripture, and they're compatible with the Christian belief. Appreciate so it. hopefully that answers the question. It did. Thank you. Okay. How do dinosaurs fit in the equation? Dinosaurs fit in the equation. Dinosaurs existed. Dinosaurs existed. As a matter of fact, when you read Job, Job actually talks about a Leviathan, which sounds like a dinosaur. It was a dinosaur. Dinosaurs existed with man. Now, so people say then, then what happened to the dinosaurs? Now, actually, when Noah got in the ark, I believe he took some of them with him. Now, people say, well, how in the world are you going to take a dinosaur on the ark? Well, they didn't have to be full-grown dinosaurs. It could be baby dinosaurs. You didn't need a, a, a Tyrannosaurus rex. But there was no incompatibility between man and dinosaurs. 
men existed, dinosaurs existed. There's nothing incompatible at all about that. Yes, sir. I have a question about Scientology and what it is, and is that similar to scientism? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Scientology is a cult. Okay. And it is a cult that was created by Ron L. Hubbard, and it's supposedly supposed to be based on scientific understanding that, you know, that there are these, these engrams and stuff that you have in your mind that forces you to do wrong things and have wrong thinkings and that if you get rid of those and you'll be free, you'll be a liberated person. But it's not really scientism. But I think I may be, I maybe I'll do a show on Scientology then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Is that it? No, I think that's it because I just never knew what it was and was it based on science at all or do they even know? Well, they, they, may, they may claim it's based on science, but I'm going to tell you what it's based on, science fiction. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that ends this episode of Giving an Ass. So be sure to join me again next time. And until then, goodbye and God bless. You can find out more about Giving an Answer, as well as listen to other episodes by visiting us online at www.givingunanswer.org.